God bless you. Good morning, everyone. To all my fellow dads, happy Father's Day, and uh, pray that you're all blessed today. Would you turn in your Bibles with me to the letter of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and I want to talk about two snapshots of a victorious Christian life. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, going to start reading in verse 12. Uh, just want to share with you quickly while you're finding your way there. Uh, our board of deacons and trustees and our pastors have invited Tyler Roberts and Megan Hallmark to come on board on our staff to serve as our new youth pastors. Uh, Pastor Tyler is a graduate of Evangel University in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, Megan is actually finishing a master's degree in math education right now. And so Tyler is actually leaving today for a missions trip to Mozambique. And when he returns, he's going to be making his way from California to us and arriving in July. And uh, Megan will be, they'll be marrying after Megan finishes her master's degree and, and she'll be coming to join Tyler. So we uh, look forward to joyfully welcoming them in just a couple of weeks. Look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12. And let's talk about two snapshots of a victorious Christian life. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 2.12, now, when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened the door for me, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and I went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are an aroma that brings death to death, to the other an aroma that brings life to life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to come and speak to us this morning. And as we pray, I want us to join together for one moment and pray for the city of Charleston, South Carolina. I want to pray for those from Emmanuel AME Church who lost loved ones in the terrible shooting this last week. And let's pray for America. How many of you know our country desperately needs a revival? We desperately need a visitation from the Holy Spirit. So let's pray together this morning. Father... We thank you for this day, and we thank you on Father's Day that we can address you with Jesus' own personal words, Abba. Father, you are the God of compassion and of all comfort. And we pray, Father, that you would minister your peace to the city of Charleston, South Carolina. And we pray that you would minister your perfect comfort to the grieving hearts of those who lost family members, friends, and loved ones, Lord, in this terrible shooting. Father, we pray for America. Would you have mercy on our country, God? Father, we pray that you'd forgive our sins. We pray, Father, that you would send revival and that you would heal our land. And Father, we pray today as we receive your word that you would just give us open hearts, open ears, open eyes in the spirit to receive your truth. I pray that we would encounter you through your scriptures. Would you say amen and amen if your heart agrees with me? What does a victorious Christian life look like? When you think of living a successful Christian life in 21st century America, what do you envision? What do you imagine that that should look like? What kind of life do you picture? I worry that for many today, a victorious Christian life looks like nothing more than a Christianized version of the American dream. We imagine a life of plenty. We imagine a life of security. We imagine a life of ease with few hassles and plenty of time for chillaxing. We imagine a life of independence because, after all, we're free in Christ. We imagine a life in which we're entitled to self-expression, in whatever form that might take. We imagine a life in which Christ is at our beck and call to empower us to ex excel in any and all of our pursuits. Maybe we imagine a perfectly neat, 
perfectly well-balanced, well-rounded life, not overcrowded, not overburdened, not stressed. What does a victorious Christian life look like? Just like so many today, the Christians in the Greek city of Corinth became confused about that. It wasn't always that way. When Paul first came and preached the gospel to them, they were crystal clear about what it meant to belong to Jesus. But Paul traveled on to preach the gospel in new cities. And behind Paul came other teachers who confused the Corinthians. These other teachers pointed to Paul's way of life. And they said, there's something not right with that guy. He suffers way too much. Look at all the problems he has. He has health problems. He has money problems. He has the gift of making people angry wherever he goes. Look at how he can never stick to his plans because there's always this drama and that drama. There's always something going on with him. This can't be what a victorious Christian life is supposed to look like. And the Corinthians believed those other teachers. So Paul sat down to write this letter that we call 2 Corinthians to say, victorious Christian life. You keep using that word, but I do not think it means what you think it means. Looking at Paul's words here in 2 Corinthians 2, I find two snapshots of a victorious Christian life. And I want to share them with you quickly this morning. Two snapshots of a victorious Christian life. The first snapshot is this. Paul says a victorious Christian life is like a death march. The first picture of the Christian life, Paul draws from an epic Roman military parade. Now, thanks to the French reformer John Calvin, 2 Corinthians 2.14 happens to be perhaps the most misread verse in the entire Bible. If you're carrying the old King James Bible with you this morning, it says there, Now thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in Christ. Those are great words. That is a great promise. Only that's not what Paul wrote. What Paul actually wrote was, But thanks be to God who always leads us like a captive in a triumphal procession in Christ. Now that means something entirely different. Let's talk for a minute or two about the Roman triumph parade. When a Roman general returned home victorious from a long military campaign, the Senate would grant him a triumph parade. A triumph parade was the highest honor that could ever be conferred upon a Caesar or upon a general. Imagine a New York City ticker tape parade on steroids, the likes of which we have never seen. Marching in the parade were legions of Roman soldiers dressed in their full battle array. Standard bearers and centurions and archers and the cavalry, drums and the brass, wagons loaded with spoils of war, silver and gold and jewels and spices and rare woods, Statues and obelisks, tropical plants, exotic animals in cages, masses of slaves in the native dress of their defeated countries to be sold in the Roman slave market. History records that the Romans actually cut off the bows of captured enemy ships with the mastheads, the figureheads on the front of them and rolled them down the streets of Rome like floats in a parade. Just like the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, the grand finale was the conquering general himself. In a chariot covered with gold and flowers, sometimes pulled by elephants as a show of strength. The general was dressed in a purple robe embroidered with gold palm leaves. On his head he wore the victor's crown. In his hand was a golden scepter with an eagle on top of it. His face was painted red in honor of the Roman god Jupiter. Around the general's chariot there were priests with censers of burning incense. And behind the general's chariot in chains were the prisoners of war, defeated kings, 
defeated princes and noblemen, governors, defeated generals and captains, defeated elite warriors who had fought the most fiercely against the Romans. And at the end of the parade route, these prisoners of war were all publicly executed as a sacrifice to the Roman gods. The Roman triumph parade was the ultimate display of power in the ancient world, and it was the ultimate disgrace for any prisoner of war. And here's the shocking thing about Paul's picture. Paul is not riding in the chariot with the general. Paul is not dancing around the chariot with incense. Christ is in the chariot, and Paul is one of those behind the chariot in chains, being led to his death. So here's the first snapshot that Paul gives of a victorious Christian life. He says it looks like a prisoner of war on a death march. But thanks be to God who leads us like a captive in his triumphal parade in Christ. Such language was too much for John Calvin to bear. He refused to believe that those words could be right, so he amended the text to read, God always causes us to triumph, and the King James translators followed him. But Paul meant precisely what he wrote. But what did he mean by this shocking picture of the Christian life? Well, for one thing, Paul meant something very personal. The prisoners being led to their deaths in the triumph parade were Rome's worst enemies, those who had resisted Rome the most, those who had fought the hardest, those who had inflicted the most casualties on the Roman troops. Now they were completely subdued by Rome. There was a Jewish Pharisee named Saul who went thundering down the Damascus road one day during the hottest part of the day, and he was the fiercest enemy of Christ. He was the fiercest enemy of the cross. He was the fiercest enemy of the church. Saul was so hot to spill Christian blood in Damascus that he was traveling down that road at a time of day when every other sane man took refuge from the heat. And then Saul met Jesus. And in an instant, Jesus conquered him. In an instant, Jesus subdued him. Jesus captivated him. The once fierce Saul became Paul, the prisoner of the Lord. And Jesus told Paul, you will suffer much for my sake. The worst persecutor ever became the worst persecuted ever. And you see, by using this picture, Paul was saying, Jesus has triumphed over me in every way. He has entirely conquered my heart. He has subdued my heart. He has captivated me completely. He has taken full authority over my life. I am completely in his hands. My days are all in his hands. My destiny is in his hands. You see, just like the parade of defeated warriors was an epic show of the Roman general's strength, This transformation of Saul into Paul, the prisoner of the Lord, was an epic show of Christ's strength. The Corinthians thought that Paul's suffering was a disgrace. They thought it was a sure sign that something must be wrong with him. Surely this cannot be what a victorious Christian life looks like. But Paul is saying that such a fierce man as I should become subdued by Christ and should come to suffer so much for his sake is an epic demonstration of Christ's power. If Christ could subdue my wild heart, then he could subdue anybody to him be all the glory. But, you know, metaphors can only be stretched so far, can't they? There's a major difference between Roman prisoners and between Paul. He uses two little words. He adds two little words which make a huge difference. He adds the words, in Christ. God is leading us in his triumph parade in Christ. You see, Paul is in Christ. Paul is in a love relationship 
with the one who conquered him. I don't imagine that there was any love lost between Roman prisoners and the general ahead of them in the chariot. They marched to their deaths, cursing him and hating him all the way. They were enemies to the very last. But in Christ, Paul was a prisoner of love. As Paul followed Jesus on this death march of suffering for the sake of the gospel, he loved Jesus more and more with each passing step. There's my general. There's the one who conquered me. There's the one who has captivated me. There is the one that has subdued my heart. There is the one that has entirely overwhelmed me. Look at how splendid he is. Look at how powerful. Look at how glorious. Look at how triumphant he is. For Paul, this shocking picture of the Christian life as a death march, it meant something personal. And Paul means something very personal for us too. You know, the Bible says that we are all born as enemies of God. All of us are alienated from him because of sin. All of us are estranged from him. All of us are in rebellion to him. We are resentful of his authority. We are resistant of his authority. Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. All of us are born with a hostile disposition towards him. In one way or another, we are all Saul of Tarsus. And just like Saul, Christ wants to conquer and he wants to transform our hearts. He wants to captivate our wayward heart. He wants to subdue our rebellious heart. He wants to triumph over our heart in every way, not through brute force, but through irresistible love and grace and mercy. And then he calls us to follow him on a life that is a death march. He calls us to lay down our lives for him. That means a life of self-denial. It means a life of service. It means a life, perhaps, of suffering. Jesus talked about that, didn't he? Do you remember what he said? He said, if anyone wants to follow me, he must first deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In other words, Jesus said, if you really want to follow me, then you must follow me on a life that is a death march. What does that look like? What does this death march, this crucified life look like? Well, quite honestly, it's very different for each one of us. For Paul, it involved constant travel to spread the gospel to cities that had never before heard of Jesus. And with that call, Paul had to endure all the rigors of travel in the ancient world. Dodging bandits, crossing flooded rivers, surviving storms and shipwrecks at sea. Paul encountered enemies everywhere he went. Angry Jews, angry pagans, angry sorcerers, angry idol makers, angry priests, angry politicians. He was whipped, he was beaten, he was stoned, he was imprisoned, he was tried in court. Paul was opposed by the devil and demons everywhere he went. He suffered from serious physical illness. But worst of all, Paul endured heartbreak over believers who turned on him and who turned away from the Lord. When Paul recounts all of his suffering later on in this letter, he he says that what topped all of the sufferings was the anxiety that he experienced over those that he loved who he had led to Christ. That's what Paul's death march looked like. But what about ours? What does it look like for us to deny ourselves and to carry our cross and follow Jesus in 21st century America? Well, again, it means something different for each one of us, but I I find in Paul's words some things that we might expect. What might our crucified life look like? Well, for one thing, it will probably mean Surrendering, surrendering your right to be treated with dignity in the world. In the ancient world, to be a prisoner of war in a triumph parade was almost the most humili- humiliating thing you could ever experience. The only thing worse would be crucifixion. 
Men who were once powerful and accomplished and acclaimed and feared were now taunted by children and ridiculed by peasants in the streets of Rome on their way to an ignominious death. And, you know, following Christ is that way in the world. People in the world won't understand it when Christ has conquered your heart and they don't like it and they will let you know that they don't like it. What does a crucified life look like in 21st century America? It means having your whole way of life invalidated by the mainstream of society. It means being belittled for your beliefs. It means being scorned for your values, ridiculed for your Christian morals. It means being shuffled off to the sidelines, passed over perhaps for opportunities, being less left off of guest lists. By the way, the, the quote-unquote chains that we wear are the word of God and the leading of his spirit in our hearts. We are bound by these two agents. We are bound by the truth of his word, and we are bound by his spirit who always agrees with his word. We are not permitted by Christ to function outside of these parameters. That means if the word says something's true, it is true. And in our heart, it, the spirit confirms it's true. If the word says something is wrong, if the word says something is sin, it is sin. And the spirit confirms that in our heart. What does a crucified life look like in 21st century America? It means perhaps being called unenlightened, backward, judgmental, bigoted, hypocritical. Beloved, as American society moves further and further away from our Christian heritage, the social pressure on Christians is rapidly intensifying. And in the future, our death march could include more overt forms of persecution like so many of our other brothers and sisters in Christ face every day in the world. What might, what might our crucified life look like? Well, it will probably mean surrendering your right to relax. You see, as Christ's prisoner, Paul was carrying Christ's burdens. There's two of them that I see right here in this little bit of verses. First of all, Paul tells us in these verses he was carrying the burden of evangelism. He was compelled to keep sharing Christ wherever Christ had not been shared. He was also carrying a pastoral burden. He was deeply concerned for the spiritual well-being of his flock in Corinth. Paul had made, between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, Paul made a disastrous visit to the city of Corinth. It couldn't possibly have gone worse. And after he left the city, he wrote a stiff letter to the Corinthians calling on them to repent, and he sent it by Titus. And he agreed to meet Titus in the city of Troas, and he was waiting eagerly for Titus to receive, to, to return with news of how the Corinthians received the letter. Did they repent or did they revolt even further? And even though Paul had a booming ministry going on in Troas, he was so anxious over the Corinthians, he couldn't stay and minister any longer. And following Christ is that way in the world. It means denying ourselves, and it means picking up Christ's burden and carrying them. What does a crucified life look like in 21st century America? Well, rather than relaxing, it means taking up the burden of reaching more people for Christ. It means getting involved in people's lives. It means caring about their messes and sticking your nose in them. It means praying for them. It means befriending them. It means listening patiently to them. It means sharing the gospel with them. What does a crucified life look like in 21st century America? Well, rather than relaxing, it means taking up the burden of building up his church. It means doing your part to support his church, to strengthen his church. It means loving. It means praying. It means fellowshipping. It means serving. It means sacrificially giving. Right now, here at Harvest Time, rather than relaxing, we've taken up the burden of building phase two together. You know, it means a lot of extra prayer. 
It means a lot of extra faith. We're at risk right now. It means a lot of extra work. It means a lot of extra giving. And you've been doing that. Thank you. It, it means a lot of extra patience. It means a lot of extra steps around the construction zone to try and find a door that will let you into the building. I was working in my office Friday morning, and one of our seniors came to visit primetime for the first time, and she came to the back door of my office in the far corner of the building, and she knocked on the door, and she said, I'm sorry, I don't know how to get in. You know, when we started phase two, it was a burden that not everyone was willing to take up. We had some people who came to visit us in the office. We had some people who wrote us letters and said, you know, we just can't go there. You're asking us to take on too much of a responsibility. It's too big. It's too big of a burden that you're asking us to carry. But you have taken up this burden with us, and you've carried it with us, and we say thank you. Amen. What might our crucified life look like? It will probably mean surrendering your right to independence. Prisoners in a triumph parade were chained to the general's chariot. They didn't have a choice where to go. They went only where they were led, and they went everywhere they were led. Paul says that the Christian life is precisely that way, that God leads us in his triumph parade. God leads us where he wills in Christ. What does a crucified life look like in 21st century America? Well, it might mean going when you wish you could stay put. At Troas, Paul had this golden opportunity in front of him. He was having fruitful ministry, but his restless heart prevented him from seizing that opportunity. The burden that he was carrying for the Corinthians prevented him from staying put and enjoying the success that was right in front of him. And sometimes it's that way for us. God makes our heart restless for people in another city, for people in another state, perhaps for people in another country. I believe missionaries are supposed to come out of this church. And even though we're enjoying great success right here where we are, we have to go. What does a crucified life look like in 21st century America? It might mean staying put when you wish you could go. God might keep you somewhere that you're uncomfortable because he needs you there. He might keep you somewhere that is way too expensive to live because he needs you there. He might keep you where people are just not so nice because he needs you there. You know, I'm not talking about anything related to, to this area. You know, I'm just saying he might make you stay somewhere because he needs you there. When you think about a victorious Christian life, is that what you picture? Do you picture your heart conquered by Christ? Do you picture your heart subdued by him? Do you picture yourself completely in his hands all your days, your destiny? Do you picture yourself being led on a death march, a life denying yourself and carrying his cross? That is not the picture the Corinthians had, but it was the snapshot that Jesus gave of a victorious Christian life, and it was Paul's as well. What does a victorious Christian life look like? Two snapshots. Number one, it's like a death march. And second, Paul says, a victorious Christian life is like a sharply polarizing odor. I want to take a quick poll this morning. We've had people honest in every one of our services. I wonder if there's anyone in this service who's brave and honest enough to admit that you actually like the smell of skunk. Let me see your hand. If you like the smell of skunk. Come on. We've had like, we've had, oh, there's two people right here. We've had like two or three in every service. Is there any? We're going to pray for you at the end, all right? We're going to, we're going to, we're going to blow on you at the end. Anybody else you like, come on, you like the smell of skunk. Anybody else you like this? All right, who here, now this one's weird to me, but it's, mo who here likes the smell of gasoline? Let me see your hands. What is up with you people? <laughs> you're like all like, you're all like sniffers. What is, who likes, who likes the smell of cigar smoke? Let me see your hand. Smell of cigar smoke. All right, roasting chestnuts in the city at Christmas time. I hate that smell. It's awful. <laughs> all right, who here likes the smell of New Jersey? Let me see your hand. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> There's two people. That, like, there was someone in the last service. Really? 
after World War II, military researchers tried in vain to come up with a stink bomb that would repel people anywhere in the world. And after years of trying, they gave up. It seems what smells awful to people in one part of the world smells wonderful to people in another part of the world. They could find no smell that was either universally good or universally bad. Paul continues on with this image of the triumph parade. And he talks about the smell of the incense that encircled the general's chariot and it hung in the air as the prisoners of war passed by on their way to death. To the cheering spectators in Rome, it was the sweet smell of victory. That smell meant that Rome was secure. It meant that their economy was secure. It meant that the empire was expanding. It meant everything good. But to the condemned prisoners, it was the foreboding smell of death. And Paul says that the Christian life is like that. When our heart has been conquered by Christ, when we take up our cross and follow Jesus on this death march of self-denial, Paul says that our life releases a distinct odor. And that odor finds three different audiences. First, Paul says, we smell good like Jesus to God. You see, when we follow Christ in a life of surrender and service, Paul says that we smell good to God the same way that Jesus smelled good to God. Paul wrote to the Ephesians that Christ's sacrifice on the cross was a fragrant offering to God. It smelled good to God. And when we are led in his triumph parade in Christ, that same exact fragrance that emitted from Christ emits from us. Paul says we are the aroma of Christ to God. We smell good like Jesus to God. This is good preaching right here. Beloved, listen, there's an important truth for us here to hold on to. Heaven is our primary audience. God is our primary audience. We live our lives playing to an audience of one. Indeed, Paul says here in these very verses, we minister before God. He is the conqueror of our heart. He is our leader in this triumph parade. So we make it our goal to please him and him alone. Regardless of what the human response is to our Christian way of life, we still smell good like Jesus to God. Regardless of whether people embrace our ministry or reject our ministry, we still smell good like Jesus to God. Regardless of whether people receive our message or refuse our message, we smell good like Jesus to God. Listen to me, if Harvest Time never did another thing in the world, if all we ever did was gather together here to worship him, you know, that would be enough. If we never transformed one more life through pathway, if we never reached one more person on the mission field, our worship would be enough because when we gather together in this place and we lift up prayers and the praises of the saints, we smell good like Jesus to God. <laughs> but the Christian life is more than that, isn't it? Because Paul says God is our first audience, but he is not our only audience. When we follow Christ in this death march, Paul says that second, we smell like hell to those who are perishing. Beloved, listen to me. Here is a truth that American, that American evangelical Christianity must recapture, and we must recapture it now. There are lots of people in the world who do not get us, and they never will. A few decades ago, the American evangelical church went on a quest to become more likable in society, to become more presentable, to become more reasonable, to become more relevant. And in so doing, it took its focus off of Christ, off of his cross, off of our call to the crucified life. The funny thing is that the more likable we have become, the less influential we've become, the less fruitful we've become, the less powerful we've become. You see, the odor from our life 
of surrender and sacrifice to Christ, it is a polarizing odor. It smells good to God, but it repulses those who are perishing. To those who reject Christ and his cross, our whole way of life stinks badly. Our faith in unseen things stinks badly. Our devotion to Christ, our worship, it stinks. Our message, it stinks. Our moral values stink. Our self-denial stinks. Our service, our sacrifice, it stinks. They see no point to our way of life. They see no value in it. They see no fun in it. And they see no future in it. I've wrestled whether to say this next thing to you or not, but God gave it to me, so I'm going to say it. And it's Father's Day, so you have to love me. As I watch things go by on social media, I see that some of you always align yourselves with those who mock Christians and who mock Christian beliefs and Christian values and Christian morals. You always align yourselves with those who ridicule and belittle the Bible. And it seriously calls into question whether Christianity stinks to you. Because if it stinks to you, then Christ has not conquered your heart. Your allegiance is to secular, godless society and not to the truth of Jesus Christ. And here is the ultimate irony. What those who are perishing consider living the life actually results in death. It results in death now. It results in death forever. Jesus said those who believe on the Son have eternal life, but those who refuse to obey the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Jesus is a sharply polarizing odor in the world. He is now and he has always been. When we follow Christ in the death march, we smell good like Jesus to God. We smell like hell to those who are perishing. But we smell good like Jesus to those who are being saved. Worship team, you can come and help me. We smell good like Jesus to those who are being saved. Both Luke and Paul use this very interesting term for believers. They call believers those who are being saved. In Acts 2, you know the verse. It says, God added daily to their number those who were being saved. Paul wrote earlier to the Corinthians, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God to salvation. In the New Testament, salvation is both a moment and an ongoing process and a future hope. I am saved in Christ, I am being saved in Christ, and in the end I shall be saved in Christ. And here's the truth about this death march that Jesus has called us to. This life of surrender, this life of self-sacrifice, this life of service. This death march results not in death, but it results in life. It results in abundant life here, and it results in eternal life in the hereafter. It results in a life that smells good like Jesus to God now and forever in heaven. To some we smell like hell, but to others we smell good like Jesus. They're drawn to Jesus through us. They're enticed through our worship, through our proclamation of the word of God. They're attracted to Jesus through our way of life. 
They're compelled by our unwavering commitment to him. They're intrigued by our undying devotion to the one who has conquered our heart. If you want to know how to be fruitful, how to be powerful, how to be relevant in society, it's not to compromise on God's word. It's to stand on it more secure and more firm forever. And then an odor will release from your life that will attract others. Our Kent Hughes tells the true story of a World War II soldier who was serving in Europe and every week his girlfriend from home wrote to him faithfully. Every week when there was mail call, there was always a letter for him. And one week he showed up for the mail call and the postmaster said, I'm sorry, soldier, there's no letter for you this week. And he said, that's not possible, it can't be. She never misses writing. And then he smelled a particular fragrance in the air. His girlfriend was in the habit of heavily spraying every letter that she wrote to him with her perfume, and he could smell her perfume in the mailroom. He said, I know there's a letter here for me. The postmaster said, I'm sorry, son, not this week. He said, I know there's a letter. I can smell it. And so the postmaster led him behind the counter, and he went sniffing in all the pigeonholes, and finally he found his love letter in the wrong slot. Can I tell you, that's how we are to some in this world as we follow Christ in this death march, as we follow him in this life of self-denial and service, as we follow him in this life of suffering, our life emits an odor that smells to some like home. It resonates with them. It smells to them of an enduring love that perseveres through all of life battles. And they say, I have to find the source of that. I have to have that. And we are to them a love letter from heaven. What does a victorious Christian life look like to you? For Paul, it looked like a death march that magnifies Jesus and a sharply polarizing odor that attracts some and repels most others. After Paul gives these two snapshots, he poses a question, and who is able to fulfill such a task? Who is equal to such a task? Who is able to follow Jesus on this way of the cross? Who is able to carry these burdens? Who is able to live life being a sharp smell, repelling some and drawing others? The answer is, we are. In the next chapter, he says our sufficiency for this, it comes from Christ. Who is equal to such a task? We are in Christ because he is the one who has conquered our hearts and he is the one who leads us in this triumph parade. But thanks be to God who always leads us like captives in his triumph parade in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. Stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place this morning. Thank you.